Okay, folks, so today's topic, water supply. Water supply is basically the primary objective of what we do is to get water onto the fire. Uh, by putting water on the fire, we're gonna cool the fire and extinguish it. Uh, and water is the most common extinguishing agent that we use by, uh, in any fire department we use. Um, water, water supply and what we're gonna be learning about today, what we're referring to is how we get the water um, to a fire scene. Uh, in municipalities, water is usually supplied to their hydrants. However, of course, we're rural departments and we don't have that luxury in a lot of our areas. Uh, so a lot of times we have to be drafting from ponds, rivers, storage tanks, cisterns, other ways. Um, and we have to have confidence that our water supply is going to be there when we need it. We have to have a, the right quantity of water supply and we, we need to know how to, how to move that water to where we need it to be. This is one of, it's a very important uh, topic and uh, there's a little bit of background that we need to get into first. And the, and the background is about our water supply systems. Um, typically there's two different types of water supply systems. One is public, that's a function of local government, um, and then the other is private. Uh, private may be uh, provided by, provide water to certain areas under contracts, either to a municipality, to a single property owner, um, they could be industrial facilities, they may be public supply uh, distribution systems separated uh, from the public system entirely and they may serve just like a particular area. We do have a number of private water supply systems around our area. Um, it, it, we have private hydrants that are operated as well and uh, but they, they still are able to, to give us the water we need to do our job which is to extinguish the fires. So municipal water system, uh, there's, a, there's a long way that that water typically has to go before it's going to get into our trucks and we're able to put the wet stuff on the red stuff. Um, most of our municipal system, first thing it's going to do is be it typically go through some kind of municipal system, especially for the hydro and things like that. Um, municipal systems are owned by local governments. Um, some could be privately owned. Uh, but typically they come with the same types of source, uh, the, the same components to them. So you're going to have a water source and you can see on the on your screen there the water source at the top. Next is a treatment facility. Most of what this uh, this graphic is showing you right now is a treatment facility. The way that the water goes in, it goes into uh, different pumps, intake screens, um, and then it's uh, this is how it's cleaned. So once it's clean, then it goes into what's called the distribution system. And that distribution system then goes out to private homes, goes out to um, and goes out to private homes, goes out to uh, the fire hydrants, and is now the end user. See stuff over there. So water supply sources. Our water can come from uh, from any of any number of places: wells, springs, rivers, lakes, ponds, reservoirs. Uh, the only the only thing that a water supply system has to have going for it is it has to be large enough to meet the need of the total demands of that service area. And the total demand could include drinking water, could include water for for bathing. Uh, so uh, oftentimes this water that we're dealing that we're working with isn't just you know obvious, it's not just there for hydrants and for putting out fires it's for all sorts of different things so as long as the source is large enough that could be a, that could supply us our water for our for our treatment facilities so when we talk about the water treatment or uh, or water processing facility uh, they process water to remove the impurities and, and minerals that could be harmful to humans um, it could also be harmful to animals, plants. Uh, nature depends on, quali uh, on quality, on, uh, on the quality of the water source. So we need, uh, we need to have good water for wildlife in the area, uh, but the water system also must be suitable for us to drink. Uh, we typically put it through these water treatment plants and use things like chemicals and UV radiation to kill bacteria and harmful organisms. <clears throat> so, if one of these water treatment facilities, however, has an issue, uh, it could impact our ability to have water on a fire scene. Uh, different things could happen at a water treatment facility that, 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 that shut it down. There could be mechanical breakdowns, a natural disasters, loss of power supply, or a fire, which would be somewhat ironic. But if, any of the, if, if something were to occur where the treatment facility was down, that is a major health, uh, public health uh, situation and a safety issue when you look at it from the, from the water supply for what we do with fire departments. 
So once it's gone through the, the treatment facility, it goes into what's called the distribution system. The, basically, the distribution systems are just a means of moving water. They're required to move the water from that original source uh, from the treatment facilities and then on to the distribution points and the use points. Uh, there's a few different types of distribution systems out there. Um, one is gravity fed. Uh, pretty straightforward. It's, you know, you deliver the source of the water to the, to the treatment plant and then the distribution system without any pumping equipment being used at all. It's all based on elevation pressure uh, and having a difference of height from the source being at a higher place, at a higher point, and then the and everything else being down uh, downhill from there. The only time this kind of system would work, and uh, being a gravity only system, uh, when the primary water source is located more than 100 feet higher than the highest point in the water distribution system. Anything else, and, and you're gonna have to start putting pumps in the line to make sure that that water keeps flowing. Um, a lot of, and, and this, this is actually pretty common in, in, in some of our areas as well, um, and certainly in the mountains um, where, you know, from the Alpine, it's, it's quite a bit higher and we don't need to be putting any pumps in the line for it to be coming down into our treatment systems. The next one we have as well in the distribution system is a direct pumping system. So what that does is it uh, places the pump near the water source or the treatment plant to create the required pressure. Um, this is often found in an agricultural, industrial settings. Uh, you, you have to put one or two, one or more pumps in, uh, to draw water from the primary source and transport it to, a, to the point of use. Some of the disadvantages of that is that you have a total dependence on pumps. Um, if any of the pumps go down, you are going to have issues with that supply of water. You're also dependent on electricity to run those pumps in many cases. So when the power system goes down, they'd have to have backup power to make sure that the pumps keep running. And if that backup system goes down, again, issues with, a, with the supply of water coming through. So we often have duplicate pumps in the same system uh, to ensure the system reliability. The most common that you'll find is the combination system. It's used by most communities, uh, and that's a combination of both the gravity and the pumping system. So you've got, you, you're using gravity where you can, and you're putting pumps in where you need to. So um, the water is pumped into the distribution system, into in some cases into elevated storage tanks. And you'll see on that picture there, they have an elevated storage tank. Uh, the elevated storage tank will then use the gravity to get it back down into the system again. Um, when the consumption demand is greater than the rate at which the water is pumped, the water flows from the storage tanks into the distribution system. So it's like a little storage tank for us. So we've always got a, a, a supply of water ready to pump into the system whenever demand increases and the water supply starts going down. So when, but when our consumption is less, then the water uh, will be pumped into the, into the storage <coughs> tanks and, uh, and, and saved for when we need it. You'll find, the, uh, you'll find these types of systems uh, at many industrial facilities um, and sometimes they're available for the fire department to use as well. So. The next stage in the, in the distribution system is it, when it gets out and how does it get to, our, to the end user. So the way we do that is piping. Basically uh, the piping that we have is gonna determine the ability of the water system to, de to deliver the right quantity of water to us at the pressures we're going to need. Uh, a lot of people, uh, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as water mains. Um, and uh, they're generally made of cast iron, um, asbestos cement, uh, steel, polyvinyl chloride, or uh, concrete. Um, water flow flowing through the piping creates friction that can often reduce the water pressure. So they have to account for that when they're creating these. And that's why they have these large diameter pipes. Um, and the in internal surfaces can often, offer, can often uh, create a resistance as well. Uh, the grid uh, is an interlocking network of water mains that compose the distribution system. So you see the way that they have it here. It really looks like a, a grid pattern. Uh, and so you've got basically water being supplied from multiple points and it feeds into this grid system. So the types of uh, water mains that we have, you have, uh, you see the large pipes in this uh, diagram here, those are called primary feeders. Uh, so they're large pipes, <coughs> they're fairly widely spaced, they convey, they convey large amount quantities of water to various points in the distribution system and they can supply the smaller secondary feeder mains. Um, these can be very large. Some uh, range, well, they range from about 16 inches, which is, again, you know, quite a big size, to, to up to 72 inches in some cases. Uh, so again, moving a lot of water. Uh, 
Once it moves from the primary feeder, it's just going to go into the secondary feeders. These are basically the intermediary pipes. They're going to connect the, the they interconnect with the basically the primary feeders with the distributors. Uh, you're typically looking again that you're a little bit smaller than a primary main here, where you're looking at about you know 12 to 14 inches in diameter, and a lot of times you're going to have and you should have control valves uh, located throughout that can stop or start the flow of water when you need it to. The final type uh, of main we have is the distributors. Uh, these are the smaller water mains, uh, typically six to eight inches, and uh, these are going to serve individual fire hydrants, uh, commercial, residential consumers. Um, and uh, typically, they also are, are made in such a way as to create a great. So again, these are going to be, uh, they try to make them into a grid pattern. At times, you may get uh, these, uh, these distributors may end in a dead end, um, where there might be a hydrant at the end and, and the pipe will, will stop right there. So you want to always have at least two or more primary feeders running from the source to high risk in industrial districts of the community. Um, the secondary feeders should provide water from primary feeders along two directions to any endpoint. All right, control and shut off valves. I mentioned that in their system, we need to be able to control this water. We need to be able to shut it off at certain times. Um, and the way we do that is through these control, uh, is through these control and shut off valves. You can, hear me. You can see a picture of the control valve. There's a great picture of the control valve there on the left of the, of the slide. Um, they're located throughout the system. They allow sections to be turned off, turned off or isolated. Um, typical types of control valves, you, ca you have some that are pressure reducing, pressure sustaining, pressure relief valves, flow control valves, all sorts of different types uh, and, and for different purposes. Uh, then you have your shut off valves. Shut off, uh, shut off valves uh, or basically are, they allow the flow of water to individual customers. Uh, they, they allow you to shut off the flow of water to individual customers. So one person, uh, we need to shut off the water to that house. Uh, and that's typically how you're going to do it. So these are the ones we're more likely to, to run into if we needed to shut water to a certain house, depending on what was going on in there. Uh, these control valves uh, would be where we would have to access that. We don't typically have keys for them, so usually we'd need somebody from uh, utilities department to come in uh, to help us with that and to, to help us isolate water and shut it. So shut off valves are also known as isolation valves. In some places they're also known as stop. So now we get into where it actually starts coming into our field <laughs> with fire hydrants. So fire hydrants are the most dependable source to provide us with water for firefighting purposes. They provide a constant volume uh, of water at a constant pressure. They're installed both on public and private water systems. Uh, they consist of, upright steel ca uh, of an upright steel casing, the barrel, and that's attached to an underground distribution system. Uh, they're equipped with valves of their own. Uh, they have various sized outlets and, and typically we're working with a national, uh, a national standard of thread so that we are able to access it. We have uh, adapters we're able to put on uh, for them and uh, the threading is fairly universal for them. Hydrants can fail. Failures uh, or reductions in water supply or pressure can result from any number of things. Could be from a damaged hydrant, uh, a damaged hydrant where the valves or the connections are damaged, um, a broken water main, greater demand happening than the system can provide for. Um, and that's, that's a very common occurrence in our area. Uh, hydrants located on dead end water mains, like I had mentioned before, without the uh, circulation of the water, you, you tend to have uh, situations where water pressure can drop unexpectedly. Um, closed isolation valves that we weren't aware of. Res um, possibly restricted mains over time. The water mains become restricted with sediment and other kinds of debris, uh, mineral deposits, uh, and that can end up impeding the flow of water through these mains. Uh, and some and pipes or, hi or hydrants that end up being frozen, and that's something we run into as well. Is uh, you know when weather gets really cold, and those the, the water through uh, that if there was water left in a hydrant, uh, you can freeze that hydrant, damage that hydrant very badly, and then it's not there for use when we need it. If we are planning on using a hydrant, and for whatever reason that hydrant isn't working for us, we need to find another supply. Whether it's going to be a, a, a nearby hydrant. Uh, and depending on what the, the reason for the malfunction is, we may not have that option. If that's not an option, we're going to have to start looking at, at uh, finding an alternate water source where we're going to have to pump water 
uh, from a river, craft it, put it into pools like we do on, on a lot of our rural firefighting. So types of fire hydrants. We're gonna start talking about the two different types of fire hydrants that we have here. Uh, and the first one I'm gonna talk about is dry barrel fire hydrants. And this is, they're also known as frost proof. So these are the kinds uh, that we're going to be seeing around our area if we have, if we're lucky enough to have hydrants. Um, they're used when, when the temperatures may fall below zero. Um, the hydrant valve is located uh, at the base of the barrel and it allows the water to flow into the hydrant. So the hydrant itself, as you can see on the diagram on the left, when not open, is dry. There is nothing inside, there is no water inside of that hydrant. And again, that's to prevent the freezing, that's to prevent, so the freezing would cause damage and would, would, uh, would break valves, would break, you know, and could break the casing of the hydrant. <clears throat> the water only enters the hydrant once we open it. Uh, typically we do that by turning a stem, uh, the stem nut on the top of the, uh, of the hydrant. Uh, by rotating that, we're rotating the operating stem, which then opens the valve, allowing the water into the barrel. So you can see the valve at the bottom there, that valve will typically come up and then the water is able to go in. We need to be sure we drain these kind of hydrants after we're done with them. Water left standing, like I said, will freeze in cold weather. <clears throat> after each water, the water, uh, sorry, after each use, the water is going to drain through an opening at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, when the hydrant valve is fully open, the drain hole is closed. As soon as, we fully sh as soon as we fully close the hydrant, the drain hole is open. So we, we shut down the hydrant, this drain hole opens, the water is able to drain through. Hydrants may not drain if they become clogged and water may need to be pumped out before the freezing occurs. So if they become clogged and we're in the winter time, we need to find a way to get the water out of that barrel. Uh, a partially open hydrant, uh, hydrant could allow the drain hole to be partially open, allowing the, pressure, uh, the pressurized water to start flowing out as well. That'll cause erosion to the surrounding soil, and that may end up damaging the hydrant as well. Uh, when we're working with a dry barrel hydrant, we want to work with a fully open hydrant. We don't want halfway. It's similar to when we're using, uh, when we're using our nozzles. We, we don't open the bale part way. We open it either fully or we, or we shut it down fully. That's how it's going to function best. And each outlet has to be capped or have a hose attached before opening that. Uh, we don't, if we, if we leave the cap off and don't attach a hose to it, water's just gonna come pouring out and it's not gonna be doing us any good. We're now draining our own system and reducing the amount of water we have to start out the power. So we have to be very careful. One other thing we should always be careful of when we're working with dry hydrants is uh, <clears throat> when we shut it down, we wanna leave the caps off for a little bit of time uh, before we put them on. We wanna hear that water draining out and we wanna give that water time to drain out before we, put the, uh, before we put the cap on. If we put the cap on the caps on too quickly, what's gonna happen is it's gonna create a vacuum inside of the hydrant. And that vacuum is gonna make it much more difficult for the next person who comes and tries to open that hydrant up uh, and that might waste us valuable seconds or minutes when we're actually when we're when we're in the middle of fighting a structured fire. So uh, quite logically if one is a dry barrel the other is called a wet barrel hydrant. <clears throat> These are typically used in locations where temperatures don't fall below freezing. We do not have any types of wet barrel hydrants in our area but it's important that you understand that there are two different types. Um, the barrel of this, as you can see, always has water in it, and it doesn't, have, and it never needs to be drained. So you're, you know, in in Florida, it's very seldom they're going to have situations where it's going to drop below freezing. A wet barrel hydrant may be the way to go. Um, typically, it's much faster to get the water flow going uh, out of a wet barrel hydrant. Um, each of the uh, each outlet that they have here is actually controlled individually. As you can see on the diagram on the right, uh, you've got uh, two operating mechanisms and each one is for a different outlet on that hydrant. So they do function quite a bit differently than the dry hydrants do where we only have the single operating nut on the dry hydrant. These have multiple operating nuts that you would use. So now that we have hydrants, uh, we want to know, we need to know where they are. And uh, I've, I, the map I put up here is a, is a nice little area that kind of shows Scott Creek, Lee Creek area and uh, Shuswap Fire Department area. Uh, and uh, using our wonderful CSRD mapping, we, you can see uh, the little, that we have a number of hydrants in those two areas. Uh, this was probably one of the more densely populated shots I could get in here with hydrants because not a lot of our areas have, uh, have access to fire hydrants. So where we put these hydrants though, it's gonna be, they're, they're gonna be located accord, uh, according to local standards and nationally recommended practices. 
Um, and they're based on uh, typically the type of occupancy, construction size, building size, uh, population building density, and, and the size of the water mains. They're all going to dictate where we're going to be putting these hydrants. Uh, in larger municipal areas, you may find one, uh, one every 500 feet in residential areas, 300 feet in very high value areas, and possibly at every intersection as well. Uh, that's not going to be the case for most of us in rural firefighting. And knowing the hydrant locations, though, before we actually need the hydrants is incredibly important. Uh, we need to know where they are so that we can access them. We need to know where all of our water sources are so that in the event of a fire, we are looking around and saying, well, where are we going to be getting our water from? That's something that needs to be uh, thought out beforehand and, and planned for. So again, with hydrant locations, uh, we ta I talked a little bit about, you know, the dead end line and going into a fire hydrant, there's, it's going to affect your volume and pressure. Uh, the dead end hydrant uh, receives water from only one direction, limited water supply. At times, it can, it can experience uh, very sudden drops um, as a result of less water being fed to it from the, the only direction that it's getting water from. The, uh, the other one is a circulating hydrant. So with that, you're receiving water from more than one direction. It's more of a loop, right? Uh, and with the circulating hydrant, you know, a decrease from one end of the line uh, would likely be made up by the pressure from the other side of the line. So it's much less likely to experience uh, extreme pressure drops and to, uh, and to have a negative income outcome on our, on our fire suppression activities. All right, fire hydrant operation. So we need to know how to operate these things if we're going to be using them. That's, uh, you know, we need to know how to provide the water through the hoses for fire suppression, how to flow water from a hydrant to discharge uh, openings to flush sediment. We need to, in some cases, uh, we may be doing periodic inspections, um, but we actually have a person, we actually have a contractor who takes care of the inspections in our area, and we're very lucky to have them. Um, they, we need to, we should be also checking every once in a while, make sure that the caps are working properly, that they operate well. And uh, fire departments may be called upon to help with flow tests at times. Uh, we, uh, again, have a great contractor, don't typically need the assistance, but we have been doing flow testing on some of our dry hydrants, and uh, we need to be able to understand how that works as well with the pressure gauge and the pitot gauge. So when it comes to the operation, of fire hydrant. I have a little video here. Oops. Let's see. The music's great. Whether you're stretching to it or from it, connecting to a fire hydrant is essential in assuring a continuous water supply. Let's examine the procedures for connecting large diameter hose to the hydrant. There are many different styles and types of fire hydrants. Although they may look different, they are similar in the fact that they allow firefighters to access water mains below ground. Color coding these devices can indicate the size water main they connect and the gallons per minute they supply. Assigning the task of taking the hydrant should not be given at the spur of the moment. This duty should be designated by seat assignment or at the roll call. This helps eliminate confusion and indecision on the fire ground. It also promotes safety and accountability. In addition, this method allows the designated member to customize the position of the first folds of hose and cover. Follow your department's procedures for storing and arranging the proper hydrant tools. It's a good idea to keep the necessary equipment in the rear compartment. This will keep a member from stepping out from the profile of the apparatus and into potential traffic. When stretching in before the fire, position the apparatus just past the hydrant. This will allow the hydrant firefighter to pull the connection end of the hose line and an additional fold straight out of the hose bed. 
pulling an additional fold supplies the firefighter with adequate line to avert obstacles and reach the hydrant. The additional line also allows the hose to be curved efficiently, reducing kinks that adversely affect water flow. Stopping too short, in effect, turns the apparatus into an obstruction. Once the line is in position, wrapped around the hydrant, the firefighter signals the officer, who then makes the decision to proceed. As the engine lays out the hose, it is important that the hydrant firefighter remains clear of the line, never straddle a hose. Should the line snag or become entangled, it could pull free and whip violently off the hydrant. Once the apparatus stops at its point of operation, the hydrant firefighter can then proceed with the connection. The fact, most hydrants haven't been used in years. This means their caps and connections could be rusted and painted over and difficult to remove. Placing a hydrant wrench on a frozen cap and hastily pulling the tool could result in serious injury. Here's a tip to use when opening the hydrant. Remember the mnemonic. School starts at nine and ends at three. Start by placing the wrench on the cap at the nine o'clock position. This allows the firefighter to use their weight to push down on the tool and break the connection. End by tightening and securing the cap. Place the wrench in the three o'clock position and push down to apply force. Some departments use cheater bars to help their members gain additional mechanical advantage. Always remove the large steamer cap first as this provides the maximum access to view the hydrant's interior. Once the cap is removed, look into the opening. The barrel should be dry and free of debris. If it's not, inform the officer the hydrant may be out of service. If there is garbage in the barrel, it must be removed. Never reach into a hydrant with bare hands. Use a tool and gloved hand to carefully extract any large obstructions. To clear smaller waste from the barrel, open the hydrant slowly. The force of the water will lift the trash up the barrel and out of the steamer opening. Opening a hydrant quickly may trap garbage at the top of the barrel keeping it from being expelled. In order to test the operational performance of a fire hydrant, first, warn others in the immediate area. Then remove the steamer cap and make an examination. Next, take a position behind the hydrant. Don't stand in front of the caps or openings. Now with the wrench in front of you, push in a counterclockwise direction to open the hydrant. Lefty Lucy. Turn the stem slowly. The water should gradually move up the barrel. This will help clear the hydrant of debris. Now, turn the stem until it's fully open. The discharge force should be noticeably greater. If it isn't, notify your officer. Once the decision has been made to use the hydrant, continue by attaching the hose and tightening down the remaining caps. Righty tighty. Remember, some departments have the practice of placing a gate valve on one or both of the discharge openings. This allows an additional line to be used without shutting down the flow. Never wet the line without consent of the pump operator. Use hand signals, direct voice contact, or your portable radio to obtain permission. Now that we are ready to wet the line, remember, open the hydrant all the way. A hydrant has two positions, fully opened or fully closed. There is no in between. Upon conclusion of the operation, shut down the hydrant and remove the hose line. Don't be in a hurry to replace the caps. Give the hydrant a chance to drain. This could take a few minutes. Pack your hose, then come back and examine the inside of the hydrant. It should be dry. If it isn't, pump out the remaining water and notify your local water authority for inspection and service. Establishing a positive water supply is an essential step in the fire attack procedure. Assuring the supply prior to commencing an attack 
increases your member's safety by reducing the chances of the line going dry. Only with an adequate amount of water can extinguishment be expected. A working hydrant supplies the lifeblood for our firefighters. Thanks for watching. Okay. <clears throat> I think I'll spare you listening to that music one more time, but uh, uh, what they did in that video was, was pretty picture perfect in terms of how you, you operate a, a fire hydrant. There are a couple of differences in how, you know, how I've uh, been taught and how I've uh, moved up the line uh, doing it. Uh, one would be they, they were using the large steamer port there as, their, um, as the area where they were flushing from. Um, we often use the smaller ports on the side, the, the two and a half connectors at the side. Um, either one typically works. We don't come into the same problem of having, uh, you know, mannequin arms and other things within our hydrants uh, around here, but it could happen and we need to be aware of that. If you did need the extra size, going out of the large steamer port out of the front would certainly be the way to flush the hydrant that way. Uh, I also heard them say, you know, wet the line. It's great terminology. Charge the line is the is the terminology that I've that I've kind of moved up with. So, uh, whichever way you want to talk about it, that's fine by me. Um, in that video, what they did was they began with a forward delay. So that's a hose lay. For those of you who did fire streams, hoses and appliances with us uh, a few weeks back, um, that was that was a picture perfect forward lay. And it also showed you some of the some of the difficulties in it and some of the things we might might need to be aware of, including stopping too short. Uh, so the fire deploy, so the apparatus needs to make sure that their rear bond, that their rear fender clears past the the fire hydrant if you're going to be doing a forward lay, uh, and again they showed you why in there, All right? Uh, so we also need to be sure that uh, you know I've seen people and I've I've been on scenes before where I've seen hoses hooked up directly to fire hydrants. Uh, that is a big no-no for us. We want to make sure that the water always goes into the pump first and then into the attack lines. Uh, we never go directly from the attack line, the attack lines to the hydrant. The only time we do that, and you'll see that when we do live fire training, because again, we're in a very controlled environment with, uh, and uh, and it's a it's a much safer situation there. Um, we cannot control the discharge pressure of the attack lines if they're attacked if they're attached directly to the hydrant, though. Um, <clears throat> whatever the, the hydrant pressure is, that's the pressure coming out of the lines. So always make sure you're, you're feeding the, the hydrant into, into your apparatus and then taking the discharge lines off of the apparatus. Um, that'll give us the best control possible of the, of the water supply, flow, pressure, and amount. This looks like the same one. Nope. Hold on here. There we go. So rural water supply. So in, in areas that aren't served by municipal systems, uh, or even if they are served by municipal systems, perhaps they don't have a hydrant system, uh, residents are gonna have to rely on wells or cisterns for water uh, in some areas. Um, there's gonna be no hydrants. Firefighters need to depend on other water, uh, on, on getting their water from other sources. So water supply in rural areas requires frequent practice. We need to know how we're doing it. We need to know how to do it. We need to know where we're getting it from and we need to practice it very regularly. So that, that's going to take up a lot of our time in our, in our paid on call departments. Uh, but it is something that's very important. Again, water is, uh, water is our lifeline out there. We need to make sure we know how to get it and then we can keep a constant supply going. So with our rural water supply, we're looking at some of the static water sources that might be there. Um, the static water sources, they need to be accessible to our pumper uh, or to a portable pump, depending on which uh, technique you're gonna use to, get the, to move the water. Uh, almost any static water source can be used in your area as long as there's a sufficient quantity of water and it's not contaminated to the point of creating a health uh, hazard or damaging the pump. Um, the other thing is that it has to be a sufficient depth. So things that we could use, like I have up here, rivers, streams, lakes, ponds, reservoirs, swimming pools. Um, you know, in, in certain cases you'll see, uh, and wildland firefighting does this quite often when they're setting up uh, the, the structure protection system uh, with the sprinklers to protect against wildfires. Oftentimes if there are nearby uh, swimming pools, that's where they're going to be supplying their water from. It's a great supply, uh, clean, and uh, it's just as good as any other water you can get. The way we get that water is called is by drafting, and drafting is simply using vacuum pressure to draw water from that static source directly into the pump. Uh, the pump will draw, but the the thing about drafting is that pump will draw anything in in the vicinity. You have to make sure you have at least a two foot uh, two feet of water 
all around the strainer uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, hard suction. The pump could be very damaged if it draws in uh, too much debris, uh, fish, sediment, other things can be drawn in as well. Uh, that's why we have those strainers in place to pr protect the pump intake um, and, pr and prevent it from drawing in the, this uh, debris, uh, fish. Um, when the draft, once we've identified our drafting location, we want to take a look at the swivel gaskets uh, on the hard suction. We want to make sure that they're good to go. They've got the O-rings on. Uh, we want to select and connect the appropriate length of hose, and we want to place a strainer on the end of the hose, make sure, again, that we're not drawing debris in. Uh, another way that we may see drafting used is through the use of dry hydrants. And many of our areas right now are using dry hydrants. Um, a dry hydrant, or is, is another name for it is a drafting hydrant. Uh, basically, all it is is a pipe with a strainer on one end and a connection for the hard suction hose on the other end. Um, we often install these uh, on lakes, close to rivers, um, and, and uh, the connection needs to be a con the right height uh, so that we can get a, the hard suction attached to it or the portable pump. Um, and uh, often we're going to be putting these uh, close to clusters of buildings or in a very accessible place for our fire department. So the other thing, the great thing about dry hydrants is it allows our firefighter, our fire departments to reach underneath frozen lakes. So the strainer is there all the time, the, the, the layer on top may be frozen, but we're still able to access the liquid water underneath that frozen layer. A couple of areas that have them are you know, in the CSRD, we have them in White Lake, Swansea Point, Solista, all, and, and, and more going in all time. So um, we found these to be very reliable and a great way to get to the water supply we need. Portable pumps. Uh, portable pumps are typically uh, they're hand carried or transported on the uh, by by vehicle uh, to wherever the water source is. Um, they can deliver as much as 18 uh, 1,893 liters or 500 gallons, basically, of water every minute. Uh, these portable pumps uh, are 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 great. Typically, if we're if we're close to a lake, we're going to be throwing a portable pump close to that lake. We can draft straight from it, and we can we can uh, pump the water into are uh, into our portable uh, portable tanks. Uh, the water can then be drafted from the portable tank into the engine and used for firefighting. Uh, the problem with the portable pumps is often that they can't keep up with the demand. Uh, if, we're, if we're using a lot of water uh, through our engine, the engine has much more capability to pump water than a portable pump does. Uh, you can move a heck of a lot more water um, using the pumps on our engine. So if we're not careful, we can end up depleting our water source if the only thing supplying us is a portable pump. We need to be very careful about that. Portable tanks. Uh, this is something we all have a lot of experience with in rural firefighting. These are the collapsible tanks that are carried on fire apparatus. Uh, they can hold between 600 to 5,000 gallons of water, depending on the size that we use. Um, they need to, when we're using them, we want to make sure that they're accessible from multiple directions. We need to be able to, we need to be able to dump water into them, and we need to be able to draft the water out of them. You'll have one engine drafting the water. The tanker will, uh, will basically, a tender will go and uh, pick up the water, draft the water from a static source, uh, come on a shuttle run, and, draw, and dump it into a portable tank. The pump operator is then able to draft the water into the pump uh, from the en of the engine, and the tender then goes to get another load. Uh, a lot of times you'll see uh, apparatus will have these large dump valves, like in the top right photo that I have on this picture here, it's a, that's a dump valve. It helps us to unload water at a very fast rate. Typically we can do it up to 3,000 gallons per minute using a dump valve. Um, and with a system like this, we can also add uh, portable, uh, portable to more portable tanks. We can put more tenders into the mix, uh, more attack engines. They can be added very quickly. The system can become bigger or smaller depending on the needs that we have. And we can, and we can funnel water from one place to another uh, using uh, jets, what's called jet siphons. Uh, and and at the bottom right uh, photo there is, of a, is a picture of a jet siphon. What that's used for is to actually pump water uh, between portable tanks. Uh, we will, and, and we do that by by uh, actually running water into it, creating a bit of a vacuum or a, a, a siphon uh, from it, and uh, and then the water will be dumped into the into a nearby portable tank using the discharge, the larger discharge. So a few things about the setup of uh, portable tanks. Before opening it, we want to make sure we have uh, we spread a salvage cover down. 
um, or some kind of heavy tarp. Uh, that's going to protect the liner. Uh, we don't want the li liner to be punctured or rocks to be coming through it. We also want to, before we even do that, we want to make sure that the spot we've chosen is as level as possible to ensure that we make them, that we can have the maximum capacity in that. If we're putting our tanks on a hill, you're going to reduce the amount of water you can have. Uh, because the water is going to start spilling out over the low side. Uh, it needs to be positioned in a location that allows easy access from multiple directions. We need to be able to draft from it, but we also need to be able to dump, uh, dump the water into it. All right, sorry about that. Um, it's ideally going to be set up, uh, set up so that more than one mobile water supply apparatus can offload at the same time, if you can do that. If not, we may need to be lining uh, our tenders up uh, and, and dumping water one at a time. We also need to be sure when we're setting it up, we set it up with the drain on the downhill side. That's something that often gets overlooked on fire scenes and can make your life absolutely miserable. If there is any kind of slope, whatever the slope is, you wanna make sure that the drain that's at the bottom on one of the sides is, is, is pointed downhill. Uh, again, we could have several set up at once. The attack pumper uh, while mobile, Basically, the one for the one for the attack pumper while the mobile water supply apparatus uh, can dump into the other ones. So the attack will be sucking out of one. The tender will come and it will drop the water into the other one. We can then use jet siphons to move the water from where the the water was dumped into where the water is being drafted from. I talked a little bit about water shuttle operations already, but we will get into that a little more. This is a great, uh, a great illustration of a typical water shuttle operation. Um, using, for, for water shuttle operations, we use uh, what are called tenders. It used to be called tankers, and you, you see, you'll sometimes hear me kind of going back and forth between that. We don't call them tankers anymore, though. Uh, and the reason why we changed to water tender was to avoid confusion with the air tankers that are used in BC wildfire service for wildland firefighting. Uh, the large uh, planes that are used to drop water, those are called tankers. So we're just going to call them tenders from now on. So these transport large volumes of water uh, to the fires. Uh, engines uh, typically can carry around, you know, starting at around 500 gallons. Tenders, uh, you know, carry, you know, would start more around the 2,500, uh, 2,000 and up range for a tender. And uh, you can get as high, you know, 3,500 isn't unheard of either for, uh, for a tank size on a tender. The number of tenders you're going to need is going to depend on a few different things. The distance between the fill site and the fire scene. Uh, if it's a longer, longer trip, it's going to be a longer uh, fill time. It's going to be a longer time for you to get that water. So having multiple tenders uh, allows you to continue to have continuous operation and continuous supply coming from the source. Uh, the time it's taking to dump and to dump and refill that could have uh, that could be because of you know issues with drafting. Could it could slow you down? Uh, it could be a, a long distance for you to go. It could be. Uh, you know, it could be just that the water that you're trying to pump from, there's just not enough of it. And then we're also going to be looking at, you know, for the number of tenders we need, what are our needs at the scene? How big is this fire? Uh, there are, you know, calculations out there in terms of, you know, we need big water for big fires. So we're going to need a, you know, the more, the, the bigger the fire is, the more that we have concerns with that, the more water we're going to need to be able to put it out. So when we set these up, we need to, they need to be set up so the water moves as efficiently as possible from the fill site to the fire scene, and the, uh, which is the dump site, right? So the dump site at the fire, it's usually located near the fire. We want it to be close. We want it to be somewhere where we don't have to be dragging our hoses, you know, 500 feet up a hill or something to, to get to it. We want, we want our water supply close. Uh, usually consists of uh, at, le uh, at least one, often more portable tanks into which the tender will then deposit the water. Uh, before returning to the fill site. Um, for larger shuttle operations, always consider you uh, appointing a, what's called a, a water supply officer. I've been put in this position as a water supply officer and I saw how effectively it worked. Uh, the scene that I was water supply officer for, the primary engine actually uh, broke down. We had to drop the lines and bring uh, another engine into that fire, uh, into be the primary attack apparatus. And this was while we had uh, firefighters in proximity to the fire, not on an interior attack, but uh, definitely in harm's way. So we needed to get that done very quickly. 
um, we, my job was looking and saying, okay, how many, you know, how, what are the size of, how much, how much water can each of these tenders hold? Uh, what is the round trip time? Trying to make sure that we're always going to have a constant supply. Do we have enough? Do we have too many? Uh, and one, and it's also good to have that one person just thinking water all the time. So who's this? Yes, it is. A little video to show you here on this one as well. So that was a good demonstration on uh, on how we uh, how we do drafting and pump and uh, and uh, with dump site a fill site using our portable tanks. Uh, the one thing I did see in that video, they didn't put down a tarp. Uh, they were laying it on asphalt, uh, pretty clean asphalt at that point. So I can see why they didn't. But when it's very seldom that we're going to have a nice clean place like that to lay it down. So be sure that we do lay tarps down. Hey, Sean. Hey. Quick question. Just you mentioned big water supply. Do we have any kind of benchmark for how fast we want to be able to shuttle water as an idea for um, how much of a water supply we should be trying to set up as a just a number generally? Uh, there is no general number. The bigger the water, the bigger the fire, the more the water you're going to need. Uh, and that's also going to depend on, you know, your, your manpower. I mean, if we don't have the man, if we have sufficient manpower on scene and we can use the amount of fire the, of, of the pack lines we need, um, then you know we then uh, we may need more. Most of our departments are are uh, have mutual aid uh, 
automatic gate with uh, neighboring departments when a fire is uh, when they have a structure fire. If you don't, uh, most of our departments are initiating mutual aid calls so they can get more tenders on scene, uh, more uh, personnel as well uh, to, to assist in, in case you know they need the extra manpower. People can always be stood down. There are calculations, and, and uh, in the uh, in our apparatus pump operator course, we do go through those calculations and and discuss you know how you determine how much water you're going to need based on the uh, percent involvement in a roof. That makes sense. Yeah, that helps. Awesome. Yeah, sorry, we it's it's hard to give you a, a firm number here. And again, this one is is tailored very much for the exterior operations level firefighter. When we get into pump operations, there are you know there are there are um, I can and I can send you information if you're interested afterwards. Just give me an email, and I can send you information on the uh, flow rate calculations. Uh, and they're like I said, based on uh, you know fire involvement and size of uh, size of buildings. You're trying to save, to save. Okay, so. Now that we've talked about drafting, we'll talk a little bit about relay pumping. Uh, relay pumping is something that, that, again, I haven't seen very often in, in our area, but it's something we may end up having to do at times. And what relay pumping is, is it's the use of two or more pumpers to move water along a distance uh, and operating in a series. Um, these can be used in situations where the water source is close enough to the fire scene that we can actually lay supply hose, you know, from one source pumper that's drafting, as you can see from a lake here, uh, and then they will, uh, so they'll draft the water into their pump, they will then, uh, up the pressure a little bit and send it over uh, to the next pumper and the relay pumper is in the line and it'll keep going down the line until it gets to the attack pumper and the attack pumper is then able to discharge it through the attack lines and put the water on the fire. So when we're thinking about whether or not we want to be doing relay pumping, a few factors we need to consider. Uh, the water supply needs to be capable of maintaining the desired volume of water that we're going to need for the entire length of the incident. Um, the relay has to be established also quickly enough to be worthwhile. Uh, you know, we, we come with, let's say, you know, a thousand gallons in our tank uh, for an attack uh, pumper. That water is gone very quickly. If we're going to be using relay pumping or any, uh, any other system, um, we're, we need to make sure that we, we uh, we get that water supply quickly. It's a reliable supply, and uh, and and it can be it can be in use uh, fast so that we're able to get the water on the fire and we never run out. Uh, if that's not going to be the case, often what you're looking to do is then dump a tender uh, that gives you another you know couple uh, two three uh, thousand gallons of water uh, right there ready to go, as opposed to having to set up all different lines. Um, the number of pumpers you're going to need for relay pumping uh, and the distance between the, pump, uh, the between the pumpers is going to be determined by a couple of different factors. So how much water are we going to need, uh, the, different, the distance between the, the actual source that we're pumping from uh, to the fire scene, um, the size of the supply hose that we have available. Uh, for most of us, I believe that's, uh, you know, four inch. Um, the amount of the hose that we have available, uh, the amount of hose we have available, uh, you know, if we only have, you know, a few lengths of, of uh, LDH, uh, larger diameter hose, we need to, uh, you know, that this is likely not a good way to do it. Uh, and then as well, the pumper capacities. Uh, but most of our pumps are able to, to maintain the, uh, the pressures needed to relay pumping. So the, the one thing with relay pumping that also needs to be taken into consideration is the apparatus that has the greatest pumping capacity should be located at the water source. They're the ones who are going to need to be pushing it the furthest dimension, the, the furthest uh, uh, distance. Um, the large diameter supply hose or mobile hose lines uh, are going to increase the distance and volume that the relay can supply because of the reduced friction loss. So we want to make sure by using that larger size hose, we're, we're lowering what's called friction loss, uh, which will limit the amount of water that's actually traveling to, uh, to our apparatus. The best way to do relay pumping though is to plan in advance when you know, the types of situations that this would come into play for and practice, 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 practice. This is something that needs to, that we can't just uh, roll up on a scene and say, hey, I think we're going to try relay pumping today. It's something that has to be, you know, part of your playbook, something that you guys are, are, uh, are drilling on and working on constantly. So now we'll just get a little bit into some talk about fire hydraulics. So when we talk about fire hydraulics, we're talking about properties of energy, pressure, and water flow as they relate to fire suppression. Um, so different parts of fire hydraulics, including things like the water flow and pressure, uh, friction loss, um, elevation pressure, and water hammer. So when we talk about water flow and pressure, uh, the water flow is pretty straightforward. It's the, it's the quantity of water that's moving through that pipe or hose. Um, and we measure the water flow in terms of, uh, of volume specified typically in either liters or gallons per minute. Uh, gallons per minute seems to be the one most people go to. We are metric, we should be using liters, but gallons is very understandable for most people. Uh, water pressure, when we talk about that, we're talking about the amount of energy or force uh, per unit area of water. So you're talking, and typically it's measured in uh, kilopascals or pounds per square inch. Um, <clears throat> the pump can increase that pressure, whatever the source was originally, whether it was a hydrant, it comes out at a certain pressure, it goes into our pump, the pump can then increase that pressure 
and, uh, and supply the attack lines. The way we can figure out wa uh, water pressure is by using a pitot gauge, and there's a picture of a pitot gauge on the right slide there. Uh, it'll measure the water in either kilopascals or, or uh, pounds per square inch, and it calculates uh, the volume. It can help you calculate the, the, the volume of water in liters or gallons per minute. So one thing we need to a few different uh, important topics to, to think about here is as well uh, static pressure. Static pressure is the amount of pressure in the system when water is not moving. Our our, our uh, water systems are already charged. They're, all, they're already pressurized. The water moving through them is creating pressure. Uh, that static pressure is what we call potential energy. Um, it's 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 there. It's it, and it's ready to go as soon as we tap into it. That potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy, and the movement happens. So and, and it moves into our pumps. Um, hydrants wouldn't be operational without without static pressure. Uh, we measure we can measure static pressure a couple of different ways uh, by placing a pressure gauge on the hydrant outlet um, by and, and by opening the hydrant valve. Uh, the normal operating pressure when, uh, that's the amount of water in the distribution system during normal consumption. So we need to understand as well that you know normal consumption there can be peaks there can be valleys uh, but under normal but normal operating pressure occurs uh, when we're at what could be called uh, regular consumption. So you know two o'clock on Wednesday afternoon how much water is flowing through the system at that point in time. Um, this is uh, measured by connecting a pressure gauge to the hydrant just during normal consumption and we do that when we do our flow tests uh, on the hydrant. And then there's a, a concept called residual pressure. Residual pressure is the pressure remaining in the system uh, when the water is flowing. It decreases more as the water flows. So as the water flows, residual pressure goes down. And when the water stops, residual pressure will increase. Next uh, part of fire hydraulics we want to talk about is friction loss. Uh, friction loss is a decrease of pressure that occurs as the water moves through the pipe or hose. Uh, and it's caused by friction. It's caused by the water going through that pipe or hose. Um, a couple of things can impact friction loss. The diameter of the hose uh, or pipe that the water is flowing through. Uh, any valves or appliances that are applied to the hose are going to add uh, to the friction loss and are, are, going to, uh, are going to act as a limit on uh, the water flowing through the pipes. Um, the volume of water that's actually traveling through that hose or pipe is going to create its own friction and then the distance that water has to travel. So all these things are going to cause uh, what's called friction loss. Again, in the apparatus pumps operator course, we do go into, you know, there are some calculations there. And, uh, and if you go into your uh, NFPA 1002, which is driver operator, they get into some very, you know, to a lot of calculations uh, when it comes to friction loss. Um, you know, do, I you have to, do you have to put elevation into that as well? Uh, that's elevation pressure, uh, but it and, and so it's kind of, it's it is a different concept when you're talking about friction loss. Uh, that is, so elevation pressure will cause you know a, a drop in pressure, uh, but it's a separate topic. So with, with friction loss, the, the the amount of friction loss we're going to have is direct is directly proportional to the, to the distance that water has to travel. Um, the longer it has to travel, it can reduce the pressure in the distribution system. Um, it can also be caused by incrustations or, of minerals or sediment that accumulate over many years inside our pipes. Uh, and what and basically the end effect of friction loss is it's going to reduce the volume and pressure of water that's available uh, for us to use. So what Annette was talking about there with, uh, with bringing elevation into it is elevation pressure. Um, static pressure is generally created by elevation pressure, pump pressure or both. Um, elevated water tanks, they supply, uh, they supply pressure to municipal water systems because of the difference in height between the water and the tank and the underground delivery. So the gravity itself is actually creating pressure from that elevation, right? Uh, if a fire hose lay downhill, the water at the bottom is going to have additional pressure due to the ch change in elevation. If you're advancing a, a, a hose line uphill or to, let's say, you know, second, the second floor, third floor of a building, it's going to lose pressure because of the energy required to lift the water. Uh, gravity create, elevation pressure is entirely created by gravity, um, or another name for that is head pressure. It's in the water system. Uh, the water flows from a hilltop re uh, reservoir to the water mains in the valley below. That is, you know, that's that's the gravity system, and that's all from, and that's uh, uh, that's all part of the uh, elevation pressure. Looking through today because we've made it to the last slide already, and we're only an hour in. So, uh, what we have here is uh, the last part of fire hydraulics is called water hammer. So, water hammer is really bad for for our pumps, really bad for our equipment, and something that we need to try to avoid at all costs. Uh, Water hammer, basically what it is, is it's a surge in pressure caused by a sudden stop in the flow of the stream of water. Uh, so by, uh, by having water flowing and then suddenly stopping it, um, you're, what you're doing is you're taking the kinetic energy of that water that's been flowing through the system and it's instantaneously converted uh, into increased pressure. Um, because water doesn't compress, a shock wave goes all the way through that hose and back into the pump. The water, the water hammer can cause the hose to rupture. It can cause couplings to separate. It can damage. It can dam it cause damage to the plumbing on a fire apparatus. Even damage to the underground piping system, depending on how bad it is. Um, 
A similar uh, situation can occur if the valves open too quickly and a surge of pressurized water suddenly fills the hose. Uh, again, water does not compress. Uh, we need to be very close, uh, very slow and methodical with the way we uh, move our water. So the, the simplest and easiest way to prevent water hammer from happening, you always open and close fire hydrant valves and the valves on the pumper, uh, you open and close them slowly. Same when we're working with our nozzle. We wanna make sure that when we're using the bale, we're gonna open it slowly and we're gonna close it slowly. Closing it too quickly can result in this water hammer and, and, and it can have really bad effects. I've had engines go down because of a too bad water hammer coming back at it. Uh, it's a lot of pressure and, uh, and very destructive. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of water supply. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us. I'll, uh, I'm going to stop the recording now, but we'll, I'll stay on the line as well. And if there are any questions, um, I can take them now.